almost 12 million hardworking, undocumented women immigrant workers in this country today. It doesn't look great. Uh, we know that it's uphill. Sabemos que va a estar muy, hay mucho que hacer. And we also know it's probably unlikely uh, that we're going to win a comprehensive immigration reform this year. But we want to continue to fight. We know in our labor in our proud organizing campaigns that if we don't continue to fight, we can never expect to win. We have met some tremendous odds in our campaigns, the Justice for Janitors campaigns, the Stanford Security campaigns, and many SEIU and labor campaigns across the country. And they can hold and the entire history of the labor movement built on fighting, fighting until we win, and we pledge to stand with you to win that fight. Estamos con usted hasta que finalmente ganamos reforma migratoria en este país. Hasta que finalmente ganamos respeto y dignidad al 12 millón de, de trabajadoras inmigrantes que están trabajando sin documentación abajo los abusos de la explotación de sus patrones en este país. So we also stand with you in fighting the racist laws like uh, SB 1070 in Arizona. Uh, we know that the Republican agenda uh, is to divide us. Uh, they, they look at the question and issue of immigration reform as a wedge issue to build hatred and mean-spirited bills and attitudes towards immigrant workers and the undocumented community. We know that that must be stopped. It's all about politics. We know that we're in a vicious war, political war in this country. And the Republican Party does not want to have any resolutions or any social programs that are going to benefit America. They are solely in those who engage in the fight with Barack Obama to stop uh, those of us that want to help win aggressive social programs and social change in this country, we want to stop us in our tracks, create dev uh, divisive wedge issues out of these issues uh, so that they can win their new for their political agenda in November. There are 15 other states that are now, at least, that are now considering this the same kind of legislation as was passed in Arizona. I keep the mass estados que ahorita están considerando este tipo este de leyes en contra de los inmigrantes. Por eso tenemos que organizarnos. And that's where we must organize. That's where we must fight back. We must stop the states in the trap. We must boycott Arizona. We must do the actions and activities against the Dodgers, against the Arizona politicians, and against all the right-wing politics that are headed to divide us if we are going to succeed and win comprehensive immigration reform. So we stand with you today. And we will fight with you until, for as long as it takes, until, so that we can stop further laws in Arizona, so that we can repeal the one that exists, and that we can find, so that we can finally win comprehensive immigration reform in this country. We can do it, but we can only do it together. And we call on Barack Obama, and we call on Senators Feinstein and Boxer to do the right thing, to not be afraid, to be bold. To stand up for the immigrant community, to stand up for what's right. It may not be popular, it may not be polling well, but it's the right thing to do for this country. So, I want to just end this, uh, my little few words with you this afternoon with a chant we say, with chanting outside of our actions against ICE, because the ICE, it's Barack Obama has been moving aggressively, uh, enforcement actions against our undocumented members, our janitors, uh, moving the I 9 processes, which cost them thousands and thousands of their jobs. We've been chanting this chant in our marches on May 1st and on the streets across Los Angeles and across the country. And it is this. Obama, escucha, estamos en la lucha. Obama, escucha, estamos en la lucha. Obama, escucha, estamos en la lucha. And when we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. When we fight,
Cynthia. And now I'd like to welcome Pastor Ryan J. Bell of the Hollywood Seventh-day Adventist Church, who I've had the pleasure of sitting uh, together in a meeting at Senator Feinstein's office. He's also my Facebook friend. <laughs> and uh, he continues to really inspire me, so Pastor Ryan, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm the pastor of the Hollywood Adventist Church. There are a few of our members here as well. I think we missed the roll call, but uh, a few of us are there as well. Yeah, we're not chanters or cheerers, maybe, but we're here. <laughs> and I would have to say that you know that Ikar is my synagogue as well. So I feel really confident being here. I love I love the people of this congregation, and it's an honor to stand here with uh, so many of you as well. Um, I, I represent this uh, this afternoon 150 members of our congregation. And uh, from where I'm standing, you, you folks look amazing. This is incredible. You should be so proud of yourselves and to come out in the middle of a Sunday afternoon. Uh, this is awesome. So congratulations to you. I wonder if we have any of our elected officials here today. Do we have any of our elected officials? How do you guys think like, how do you This is a roll call. No one? How about any of their staff? Anybody here from any of their offices? Anyone? No? Okay. Well, they should be here too. Yes? Yeah, they should be here too to hear what we all have to say. But we'll, uh, we'll pass this word on to them, yes? So I stand before you today as both a pastor and as, a, as an American citizen. As a pastor, I understand this to be primarily a moral issue, the issue of immigration. Each and every day, the lack of immigration reform affects the members of my congregation, and your congregations, and our community here in Los Angeles and around the country. People are forced to live in the shadows, attempting to eke out a living here and there, taking serious risks both to themselves and to their families, simply to put food on their family's table. And in this intense and angry debate over immigration in this country, what is too often lost is, for me, what is the most important point. And that is that we are talking here about human beings about people created in the image of God. And in God's sight, no one is illegal. Do you agree? In God's sight, no one is illegal. All people are precious. All people are equal in God's sight. And in the wake of all of this, there are horrible stereotypes and racist ideology that is used as a club against people that people we simply don't understand often. And the situation gets worse. People's lives are in danger. Families are being broken apart. All while we and our elected officials wait for a more opportune time to act. But we are here today to say that the time to act is now. We have evidence. We have evidence of what the law that we have now, or the lack of, does to our families. And here are some statistics, I think, that would help us understand a little bit of what's happening in terms of what's happening in people's lives and families right now. One in five children of school age in the United States is either an immigrant or a child of an immigrant. It's very common for immigrant families to become separated for extended periods of time from one another, and these periods of separation can range from six months to decades. Studies have found that up to 80% of Latin American immigrant children in the U.S. schools have been separated from parents for some time because of their migration. And it's that separation that's so common for immigrants who come here legally, as well as those who come here undocumented. Families that are separated from each other suffer higher, much higher rates of death depression. Children in separated families have a higher uh, risk of problems in school. And in addition, to ask most immigrant families in this room, I just wonder, you know, if we were, to, if we were just to ask those of us, and, you know, which of us is not an immigrant, right? Or the, or the, or the child of an immigrant in this, family, in this room, right? We were all uh, children of immigrants here today. There may be some Native Americans among us. But aside from those of you, all the rest of us are immigrants. But to ask immigrant families to live in constant fear of being deported or held in detention is unconscionable. Not only is that no way for people to live, but it also affects and endangers the safety of our neighborhoods. When people in our communities fear the police, they are less likely to report crime or domestic violence. And so, so fear among our communities threatens the very fabric and safety of our communities. All of this is evidence that our system is broken. I read an amazing quote from a bishop in Orlando recently which said, the so-called illegals are not so because they wish to defy the law. 
but because the law does not provide them with any channels to regularize their status in our country, which needs their labor. They are not breaking the law. The law is breaking them. But you know, the interesting thing is that this is not just a moral debate, it's also an economic debate as well. And as a citizen of this country, I realize that our country is suffering and will continue to suffer as long as we marginalize the immigrant communities among us. A few weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C. with a delegation from PICO and the Reform Immigration for America table, along with Angelica, who just spoke a moment ago. And we, we spoke with Senator Feinstein. Um, and what we heard was both positive and negative. We clearly, in this state, have two senators who support, in theory, comprehensive immigration reform. And for that, we can be very grateful. We could much, have it much worse than we have it today in terms of our elected officials. However, it's also clear that we need to have much more urgency on the part of our elected officials in California and throughout the nation. For example, they need to be here or at one of the other four immigration actions like this one up and down the state. They need to be here, and they're not here today. Every day, human beings are living in the shadows because of the system is broken, and every day, families are being torn apart because of the non-policy that we have regarding immigration. And it affects our country economically as well. Note some of these interesting statistics that you might not be aware of. A study conducted by the Center for American Progress calculated that immigration reform will increase the U.S. gross domestic product by $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years. That's a lot of money. I'm not even sure how many zeros that is. But that's a lot of zeros. Our economy, in the form of taxes and consumer spending, needs this money, this, this uh, flow of income into our, into our coffers so that we can continue to provide the services that we so desperately need in this country. $1.5 trillion our GDP could increase over the next 10 years. Here in California, another study was conducted that said if undocumented immigrants had been legalized last year, they could have generated an additional $1.5 billion in direct local spending here in our Golden State. And it seems, if you've been watching the news, like our state could really use that kind of uh, in influx of income right now. We also know how inhumane the U.S. deportation policies can be. But deportation policies also cost our country and our state a lot of money. Deporting immigrants could take $2.6 trillion out of our economy over the next 10 years. At a time of economic insecurity, can we really afford to make that kind of a mistake? In fact, we have to ask why, at a time of fiscal crisis, significant immigration enforcement funds are being spent on deporting immigrants, the vast majority of whom are law-abiding, long-term residents, when if they were legalized and brought into the um, economic workforce of this country in a, in a different way, could be generating millions and millions of dollars. So you can see, this is the time to act right now. Comprehensive immigration reform is not a question of if, but when. And the opponents of immigration reform don't have a solution. They don't have solutions. They're just wanting to send people back to put people in jail. What we see in Arizona is not a real solution. It's not a solution at all, is it? No. We can't afford to be silent in the face of a kind of oppressive policy like SB 1070 in Arizona. And we don't live in Arizona here, but we're close, right? We're friends, we're neighbors. And we need to stand together against that kind of oppressive policy in Arizona. What do you say? Yeah. Maintaining the status quo is also not a solution. But we're talking today about a real solution. Getting people to the table to create a real solution to a real problem. PICO and our partners in Reform Immigration for America have proposals, real proposals, that will benefit our families and our communities and America as a whole. But we can't do this alone. The question is, where are our elected officials? We need them to step up and act with us to make these changes. If not now, then when? We also need your help. Today, um, in your brochure and your um, information that you received when you came in, you'll find an envelope. It appears that we're going to be in this struggle for some time to come. If everything uh, on the horizon proves to be as it seems at the moment, we're going to be here for a while, fighting for this uh, change, this reform. But we're not going to give up, are we? But we need to invest our own selves and our own resources in this campaign and in this struggle. So if you can afford 
to provide some financial support to the work that PICO is doing to offset the expenses of an event like this or to continue to help us move forward in immigration reform, I want to invite you to make a donation today at the conclusion of our event. You can use the envelope that you have there in your materials and someone will be available to pick that up from you when you leave. Folks, we need to act and we need to act soon. We need to continue to put pressure on our elected officials. We need to continue to stand up for what we know is right. And we need to continue to stand up against what we know is wrong. So please, uh, go from this room, tell your friends and your family, and most of all, let's get the word back to our elected officials that we were here today, and we were wondering where they were. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Um, you gave us a lot of inspiration, also a lot of statistics, and we're going to now bring it back to some of our courageous leaders whose lives have been impacted by the broken immigration system. So I'd like to welcome um, Christopher and Malou and Drew and Jason and David up here to tell their story. Immigrants and no human being is illegal. 
Thank you. I'm a Korean. I came here about 15 years ago. I'm the board member of, and I, I am actually the board chair of Korean Research and I'm also a member of NACASAC. I'm also an active member of uh, Korean American Church in Koreatown. Uh, so let me share a little bit about Korean American community. About 15 to 20 percent of Korean Americans are undocumented. So if you go to any church or organizations in Koreatown, you will easily hear uh, stories of families suffering from broken immigration system. So I have a lot of, lot of stories, but let me just share one. Um, uh, one of my friends at church is the uh, oldest of three brothers. They came to the state when my friend was younger than 20. Um, they tried hard to get a legal status uh, here. Uh, but his father passed away during the procedure, so they ended up being here illegally. Uh, and so they, uh, they're uh, mom worked hard at restaurants to support their families and they, the, all the brothers worked and studied hard uh, to find some way, uh, but it is difficult. And recently my friend uh, got uh, some health, health problems so he had to um, quit his job temporarily, but he doesn't have any health insurance. He's, it's going to be very difficult to him to re-get the job uh, as an undocumented immigrant in this economic condition. So people come to the state for various reasons and people ended up being undocumented for various reasons. They really sacrifice, work hard to support their children, support their families, but, but they are forced to live illegally, illegally due, to, due to this inhumane uh, immigration system. Uh, immigration is about families, not just about workers or economies. Um, we need to we need to be really to the countries comprehensive immigration reform now to help these suffering families. Thank you. I am Manu Clarino from our mother Food Council in Los Angeles. My father is a US citizen and a U.S. war veteran who fought side by side with American soldiers during World War II in the Philippines <laughs> in response to the call for duty by the President of the United States in 1941. He came to this country in dreams of bringing his family here. He petitioned for my siblings in 1987 and waited in line for the petitions to be carried. During this time, my father suffered a stroke and became paralyzed. This did not stop him from hoping and dreaming that someday he would finally be united with his family. Finally, in February 1998, the priority date became current and all necessary documents to immigrate were submitted immediately. My father was elated that his hardship would finally be over. However, the Immigration and Naturalization Service were very slow in processing their papers. Before they could be called for interview, tragedy struck our family when my father died in March 1, 2000. With his death, the petitions were automatically removed. My father's case was discussed in the Senate as an example in the passage of the Family Sponsored Immigration Act of 2001 by Representative Jerry Lewis. On this basis, we applied for humanitarian costs, but to this day, their petitions have not been acted upon. One of my brother's petitions, however, was in fact denied for lack of humanitarian costs. As Representative Jerry Lewis said in his transcript, we must stop our system from adding to the tragedy of families like the Carinos who lose a loved one and at the same time have their hopes of coming to America dashed. For 23 years, we are still waiting and separated 7,000 miles away. And that this is the price that my father got from the country he fought for during the war and injustice to our family.
Curry, and I am from San Antonio Church, which is part of Long Beach Intermediate Community and Organization ICO. Long Beach ICO consists of 10 churches and represents 10,000 people in Long Beach. This is my story. My name is Christopher, and I am 23 years old, and I have been a Long Beach resident for the last 20 years. Long Beach is my home, and it's all I know. Though I'm not scared to try anything, I am terrified to go back to a place would have absolutely no family, no friends, and no real opportunity to go through my mind. Everything and everyone I know encountered and be transited here in Long Beach, California. It is not easy for me to sit here and tell you about my fears. However, I feel it is important that you have a better understanding of what I'm going through and what I am terrified of. I also want you to have a better understanding. Help us to remember that the immigrants are often isolated, afraid, and treated with Inspire us to dedicate our lives to heal our broken public policies so that we can switch from treating others in ways we just never want to be treated. Let's not now be indifferent to legalize injustice, but remain as vigilant in our loyalty to your higher law. Blessed are you. Our community is burdened by bigotry, anger, and reluctance to see you as a stranger, a migrant, a family with a refugee. We have compromised what we learned from our many sacred texts to gentleness, love mercy, and more humbly upon this earth. Let us commit to being unyielding in our insistence on legislation that is humane, sensitive to the needs of families, offering safety to those migrants who are unauthorized, and a pathway to citizenship for those who every day make important contributions to our community.
of the PICOS National Network and is made up of 20 congregational-based community organizations representing 400 congregations and 450,000 families across the state. Airport, ICO y OVO son todos miembros del proyecto de PICO California, cuya misión es traer las voces de californianos comunes a los debates de pólizas estatales para el bienestar de jóvenes y familias. PICO California es el esfuerzo estatal de la Red Nacional de PICO y está compuesto de 20 organizaciones basadas en congregaciones representando 400 comunidades de fe y 450.000 familias por todo el estado. Today, we gather here together for many reasons and you need to know that we do, do not gather alone. We gather simultaneously at this hour with PICO affiliates and allies who want to reform immigration for America in four other cities, San Bernardino, Fresno, San Diego, and San Francisco. We gather to provide a much needed combined faith voice that calls out the immoral way that immigrants, particularly undocumented folks, are treated in this country. Hoy deberían de saber que no nos reunimos solos, nos reunimos al mismo instante y ahora con organizaciones de PICO en cuatro otras ciudades que quieren una reforma migratoria para América. Ahorita mismo se reúnen en Fresno, San Diego, San Bernardino y San Francisco y nos reunimos para alzar una voz fuerte por nuestra fe que proclama la manera inmoral que este país trata a los inmigrantes y los indocumentados en particular. We gather to let the public, our representatives and our senators know that our religious communities and our friends and allies, some of, you, of, of whom are here today with us, will not let up until our children have their dream act and we pass comprehensive immigration reform and we change the unjust policies that divide our families in our congregations and schools and homes and places of work. Nos hemos reunido para hacerle saber al público, a nuestros representantes y a nuestros senadores que nuestras comunidades de fe, nuestros amigos y aliados, que algunos de ellos están aquí hoy, que no vamos a descansar hasta que tengamos el Dream Act para nuestros hijos y tengamos una reforma migratoria. We work 
um, as part of the Reform Immigration for America campaign with organizations from labor, from faith, from, from community, all working together because we need immigration reform this year. ¿Cuándo necesitamos esa reforma? Será una 
realidad el mundo de justicia que ya empieza a despertar. We have faith and justice is awakening and we need to take action so that immigration reform is a reality porque la fe con acción es poderoso because faith with action is power. Service Workers International Union, United Server Service Workers West. Well, first thing I want to do is to congratulate all of you for spending time this afternoon, taking time out to concentrate on how we're going to win comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, FDIU. Our Service Employees International Union, which I probably um, stand before you representing, is the largest labor union in the country and our largest labor union uh, in California. We have 2.2 million uh, members across the country and are continue to grow our ranks and 850,000 uh, members in California. Uh, SCIU is the syndicato más grande in todo el país. Uh, con 2.2 million de miembros y tenemos uh, 850 mil miembros de California. I'm also proud to say that we are also...
And I want to say that this is probably one of the first LA Voice large actions where we're doing this as Christians and Jews, and that's wonderful. Because, you know, there is no problem with immigration. There isn't. It doesn't exist. Okay, somos todos iguales en los ojos de Dios, ¿verdad? We're not going to solve the immigration problem today, here, at this time. Because it's going to take a lot of work over a long time, Christians and Jews and Muslims working together to make a difference. But, al andar se hace el camino. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to hacer el camino. And we need God's help. So let's pray together, Christians and Jews, and ask for God's help. I ask you to take out your program. There's a response sheet. Hay una hoja con respuestas. Por favor, de sacarlo. Y vamos a... Our dogs barking fiercely, so glad I stepped outside to look to lock them up in the backyard. This is when she saw five Long Beach Police Department squad, squad cars parked across the street. She didn't pay much more attention as she felt she had nothing to be scared of. Then there was a knock at the door, and through the glass of the door she saw officers with the policia written across the chest. The officers then identified themselves as the police and asked her to open the door as they had questions regarding the whereabouts of a man in a photo who Gladys did not know. Gladys opened the door and noticed that noticed the Long Beach Police Department squad cars were gone and there were several unmarked cars. Once the officers were inside Gladys' home, they pulled our deportation papers out regarding Gladys and began asking about family members and photos on the walls. Gladys was in shock to find that instead of letting Long Beach Police Department into her house, she had opened the door to ask. Gladys was then asked where the rest of her family was, and when she told them that we live in the back house, they came for us. We were all rounded up in Glass's living room in question and then sent to the Orange County Detention Center where we were fingerprinted. My brother Edgar was deported on the spot and we were turned loose and given a return date in July for further proceedings. <clears throat> While I think to enter our community to apprehend criminals, they should not be falsely identifying themselves as Long Beach Police Department damaging the Long Beach Police Department reputation with the community. This creates fear and mistrust, ultimately making it difficult for Long Beach Police to do their job. My sister believed that she was cooperating with police that day, not assisting ICE in deporting our brother. Thank you.